Welcome to Growth Track. This is communications class. There are two sessions of this class, and I am really looking forward to sharing this information with you. This is stuff that, uh, it's like all the things that I have read, studied, learned, took classes for myself, and I am boiling it all down into a way that hopefully will have a lot of uh, information, dense information. There'll be a lot of notes taken, but I think uh, by the time we're done with this, uh, these two sessions, these two 30-minute sessions, we'll have a really good understanding of what it means to get up in front of somebody and say something and how that all works. So if you're taking this, co this class for college credit, um, go to churchoftheheartland.com, click on Growth Track, and this is under the communications part. You'll pay a little fee there under the communications class, and there's a test uh, for you. It's an easy test. I made it myself. It's a piece of cake. So um, now there is also, if you're taking it for college credit, there's a book <clears throat> that I... <clears throat> excuse me, that I really liked called Creating Messages That Connect by Alan Nelson. It's a really simple read, uh, but I really liked it. I think it was a well done, well put together book, Creating Messages That Connect. You'll need to read that book for, for the college credit. All right, let's start with the word of prayer. Jesus, uh, we thank you, God, that you, Lord, used your voice to speak, <clears throat> speak, Lord, all that is the universe, all that is exists, Lord, was spoken at your command. And so, Lord, I thank you that we are going to use our voices to speak your words into this earth and change hearts and change minds. We want to be your vessels, Lord. Teach us how to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, first off, I want to talk about prayer. About the rest of this class, I'm going to be explaining why, how to do natural communication, how to speak, have words come out of your face that have meaning, but you can't do that without, without prayer. You cannot skip this step. You cannot overlook this step. Um, being anointed comes from being near the anointed one. Now, the Old Testament idea of the Messiah um, was, it means anointed one. So this only comes with, with time with God. You cannot skip this step. You cannot go around this step. You cannot learn enough information or read enough books on public speaking to, to get this without having this time spent with God. It cannot be uh, end around. And there's a great verse out of Psalms 133, verse 1 and 2. It says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity, which was what, of course, Jesus taught himself, like when we're together and we're unified, especially unified in his presence, like in a church service or something like that. It's, it's good. It's pleasant. And then verse 2, it's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down onto the collar of his robe. So it talks about this anointing that goes from the top all the way to the bottom. Now the top is not the pastor or the preacher. The top is Christ. And it, it starts with him. And he is the anointed one. And then it works its way down onto every buddy, every person. And that, that cannot be taught that's only you only get that all the way down you only get that from spending time with with jesus and our job is to be somewhere in this thing right you got him at the top we're somewhere in this process where where the oil is running down us and running down onto the people underneath us and that could be in a small group that could be in a large auditorium but our job is to take the spirit of god and put it into the people that are below us whatever is touching us below us now here's the thing you might be able to get away with it one time where you didn't spend time in prayer and you just get up there and and then the, the problem is you think you got away with it it's like oh oh i got away with that that's not oh i see i tell you you will never get away with it twice you know how i know because i my friends have made that mistake a few times where I thought, oh, I just don't have time to pray. I just got to, and it's like, there's a grace of God. There's like a mercy, actually, not a grace. There's like a mercy. That's God's like, all right, I'm not going to embarrass you. And then if you don't spend the time in prayer, and you don't spend the time in preparation the second time, you are about to look the fool, and it's about to be embarrassing. So the next part here I want to talk about is, is kind of, I don't know, none of it's in, in a specific order. It's just thoughts that I have and, and teachings that I want to kind of piece together here to help you to create better messages, preach better messages, get up in front of people, and even some tips and tricks we'll get, to, we'll get to later. First off, don't craft a sermon, craft an experience. 
Now, a sermon is good. Those are good, you know, but an experience is better. And so an experience, what do I mean by an experience? You know, movies have like a beginning, a middle, and an end. They've got like a path of information. They've got some things in it that are surprises. You know, if a movie just is so straightforward that it never really surprises you, you don't like it, right? We're all, we like the surprises. Let there be things that surprise you in the message. Let there be a beginning and then a, and then a middle and then an end. And so a lot of the times when we create messages at our church, we're trying to create things that, that have experiential things. There's other stories in there. Of course, we're teaching the word of God. We're going to talk a lot about that in this class, but we're beyond that. We're taking this other things and we're helping to forge it. See, some people like, like me, we lo- I love documentaries and I, I love raw information. I can handle the raw information. And other people, like as soon as you turn the documentary on, their mind goes, beep. Uh, sh- they, you know, they want the stories and the experiences and they can listen to somebody tell a testimony and just be enthralled by a testimony for 10 or 15 minutes. Whereas I'm kind of like, Eh, get to the good stuff. What's the point here? But, the, but, but when we're in a public speaking place and we're creating a message for somebody, this is something that, that everybody has to get a piece of. So we can't just make it for the one guys that like the information or make it for the other people that like the inspiration. It's got to have that experience in it that's got information, uh, um, inspiration. It's got all of it kind of blended together in a way that everybody can grab a hold of something um, that, that, that they themselves can grab a hold of a piece of it. Um, there's something about the human voice. I mean, singers, right? There's something about it. Of course, I'm a musician. I'm not a singer. Uh, I've been told many times by the worship pastors of our church to stop singing and don't do that, Heath. That's not your calling. Um, so I still kind of try to sneak it in the messages from time to time, but you know, especially Larry, he'll, he'll give me that symbol right there. Like, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. But there's something about the human voice. And I don't know what it is, but God used his voice and spoke the world into existence. And something about singing and preaching that has spiritual significance. And now I'm not against movies or even like a series like The Chosen. It's so good. But there is something about the human voice. And so that's why we are going to spe- specifically like focus in on how to use the voice that God's given us to, to put his word into the hearts of other people. That's, that's what we're really talking about in this class. Now, great communication always solves a problem. But the, but the thing is, people don't know that they even have the problem. So lots of, of the ways to begin a, a, a good message would be to explain that you've got this problem. You know, you explain like, do you, do you realize that this is happening even? You know, lots of people don't even know they have the problem. But, but the great communication solves a problem. I think one of the biggest issues with many modern day churches, or actually just churches in, in, in general around the planet, is they're answering questions that no one's asking. They don't, they're, they're answering questions, but no one even cares because they're not asking those questions. So, so it makes them feel, and you probably heard this word, right? Irrelevant. It's like, well, this is irrelevant to my life. So that's why we've got to kind of come out of the gate by explaining this, this situation here is a problem that we all face. Let's now let's talk about it. So we have this problem. We, we, we talk about the problem. And then of course, we're ending our experiential thing with how to solve said problem Um, communication always gets you from point a to point b okay point a is what they know and how they live and point b is what you want them to know and how you want them to live so you start out at point a point a is all right this is where we're at this is where we're at and we need to go from here where we're at to where we need to be and those are two far away places and good communication always takes them along this journey. Okay, here's where we're at. Now, we're never judging them for where they're at, but here's where we're at. Okay, now how do we get to where we need to be? What steps do we need to take to get them to where we need to be? 
See, I think uh, church is best viewed like a swimming pool. It's kind of an illustration I saw years ago and I really liked. Um, I saw it from a pastor in Colorado Springs. And he said, a church is like a swimming pool. Okay, so back in the day, I went to my community pool in Winnemac, Indiana. I went to the community pool. You probably have all had like some time in the summertime, right, at the community pool. Okay, so I, had, I spent time in the community pool. At the community pool, you've got the baby pool. You got the shallow end, you got the deep end, you got the high dive, right? You've got all these things and they're all going on at the same time. And so at the baby pool, you got the little ones, right? They're the little swimmer diapers and aren't they cute? And then you got the, the shallow end and it's people that are like, I'm not really wanting to go underwater completely, right? The deep, deep end, yeah, it's people that can swim and tread water for as long as they need. And then you've got the high divers. That, that's like a church. And every single Sunday, we have people that come to church in each of those things. We have baby poolers, we have shallow enders, we got deep enders, and we got high divers. Okay, baby poolers, these are people that are just now wondering if they even want to be a Christian. And so they're tapping the water. Is it warm? Am I going to get hurt here? Is this a safe place for me? Is this belief even correct for me that's what they're doing they're experimenting and then we got shallow poolers and these are people that have known christ a little bit and they're like hey i'm a christian look at me (laughs) gone to church good good don't take me too far don't weird me out but i but i'm here i'm doing it look at me look at me mom i'm doing it and then we got the deep divers and those guys they can they're they're enjoying the whole thing right and then we got the uh we got the high divers these people have been swimming for months decades i don't know and they can do all kinds of neat things and uh they're not afraid of the water one bit they're experimenting with other things that that all of those are happening in a church at any given sunday and what i've seen or what i've noticed is many churches will focus on one of those groups so they'll say all right we are a church for the baby poolers and even if they actually don't say it they are saying it implying it we're baby poolers and what happens is maybe a veteran Christian type might come, and when they, when they come, they're like, wow, this is, uh, this is like not enough for me. I can't jump off the high dive in a 18 inches of water. I'm going to bust myself up. This is not going to work for me. So they go on to someplace else. And then you've got the shallow poolers, right? Maybe the church for shallow poolers. And once again, the, the deep divers and the high divers are all, they don't really want to be a part of that. And then there's some churches that they don't have a shallow end. They don't have a baby pool. All they got is the deep end. And they take their little baby Christians. In you go. Oh, you're not making it. You don't understand what's going on around here. You don't understand all these deep spiritual things that we're talking about. Too bad for you. Of course, these little babies are, you know, (laughs) they don't last long. Our job is to create communication and environments where all of these people can come and get something from what we're saying that week. So they can go, all right, if you were a baby Christian, you actually went, oh my goodness, I understood that message today. I can't, I've never actually understood the Bible. That guy taught from the Bible, or girl, taught from the Bible, and I got the information in my heart. I can't believe I understood that. And they feel like, maybe this is for me. And the, and the, the younger Christian types, there are, you know, they're in the same boat. They're like, okay. I'm getting this. I'm starting to have a, a pace to my Christian life. And our deep divers, they might have had a few things that they didn't know about that passage of Scripture, a few things that hit them you know, between the teeth and got some challenge into them, and some even ways like, well, I thought I knew that verse, but I've never seen it that way before. And then our deep divers the same way, at least, at least giving them, I mean our high divers, we're giving them something so they can go, you know what, that still challenged me. And that still gave me some place where I didn't realize what was, what was being, uh, I didn't realize those scriptures in, in such a way. Our job is to make sure all of these people can come to church together and everybody that's in the one can take the step up. Everybody can take the step up and including the high divers, the, the high divers, they've got to make sure that, that they are leading things so that our baby poolers and our shallow enders can can follow the same process they they followed instead of just being like too bad for you i don't know <laughs> not not my problem which is what many high divers do sadly and many churches do in that same environment 
Now, you got to know what size group you're talking to. All right, today I'm in a small group kind of format. Okay, this is just me talking to some friends here. So it's not really like a big auditorium kind of a thing, right? It's me, me talking to you today. I would talk differently if I was in a very large setting. But it would be strange for me to talk that way in this setting. For instance, if I was in a very large setting, you have to put a lot of pauses after each sentence because the reverb in a large room like that makes it so you have to. But now that I'm talking to you in that pace, it's super weird. <laughs> so, so you got to know what, what you're talking to. You got to know, well, you know, are we talking about 12 or fewer people? That's a conversation. Are we talking a medium sized group? You know, basically, every time you go another step higher, there, you, you basically add a little bit more space and a little bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, less conversational and more formal. So you get to those very, very large groups like stadiums where it's a totally different kind of a thing than you're doing in a, in a smaller kind of, you know, conversational kind of, of place. And I, I just gave you the illustration there, right? If you don't do that right, if you don't know what your audience is, it just really comes off strange. So there have been times before where I thought I was going to have a church service with like a bunch of people. You know, let's say I thought 100 people were going to show up and it's like six. Uh, you have to make a call like at the line of scrimmage. <laughs> we're changing the play call at the line of scrimmage. And it's like, we're not going to do it like a regular church service because that's super weird with a church service with five people in it. So let's instead, let's gather our chairs around in like a circle and have this conversation together. And, and so you have to kind of be understanding what, what audience you're talking to. Now, when it comes to creating a message, you got to make sure that you major on the majors and you minor on the minors. This is what I mean by that. You got to make sure that the most important parts of the Bible are what you are specifically zeroing in on. And we, we got to make sure that the, the vast majority of our messages are what the vast majority of the Bible is talking about. Man, you and I both have seen over the years people that have minored, majored on the minors. So they find something about an interesting little idea and they just keep playing that idea over and over and they make their whole church based upon some tweaky little minor thing. No, let's just keep the main thing, the main thing. Who Jesus is, how he forgives us of our sins, what it means to walk with God, what it means to have a relationship with God, what it means to have grace and forgiveness over our, you know, faith. Those are the main concepts of the New Testament. Let's make sure they're the main concepts of our life as well. When it comes to public speaking, our competition is very high. And this has changed over the last few years. Um, over the last few years, the, uh, the internet specifically and the vast amount of terrific preaching going on on the internet has transformed how churches do things. Now for guys like me, you know, I'm an average preacher in a small town. The problem is when such and such, when the Smith family comes to Church of the Heartland, they've been watching super amazing preacher, literally probably, it's like the LeBron James of preaching, and, and they come and they expect me, right, middle-aged, overweight, bald guy, to be on the level of those, those guys that have the largest churches in the country because they don't understand how things work. Dude, I'm like, I'm like the high school level basketball player, not best of the NBA, right? So, so, but the problem is the internet's changed all that and it's basically had to make it so that all of us have got to be better at this than we ever thought we, we would ever had to be. So it makes this class and this kind of information all, the, all that much more important because they don't judge you based upon on that message that you're saying. They actually judge you in a comparison that, honestly, is unfair. But the reality is it's, it's of a class of public speakers that there's probably 10 to 12 
maybe a hundred of them on the planet that are that good. So, so it makes us so we all basically got to up our, up our game. And that's why most communicators are not actually as good as they think they are. Sorry to tell you, if you're a communicator, if you're a preacher, you're probably not as good as you think you are. You guys remember the American Idol, right? They always would start out those, those seasons with the people that always did the tryouts, but they were actually just terrible, you know, but they still had the courage to get up there and like basically argue with some of the best singers on the planet uh, that, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I can really sing, right? To get up in front of somebody, honestly, like I'm doing right now, and look into a camera or look into people's eyes and tell them, you need to listen to what I say. That takes some chutzpah. That takes some ego. Okay? It just does. And, and uh, that's why a lot of those people, men and women, have large egos is because it takes something, it takes a pretty good sized ego to do that. that. That same over ego creates people who think they're better at it than they are. So we got to all realize that we love the sound of our own voice and, and that's just part of what we, we love to hear ourselves communicate. We, and we're probably just not as good as we think we are. And so you're probably more in need of this class than you are aware of. Verbal communication is a creative art. Now, if we talk about creative arts like graphic design, music, uh, painting, movies, right? Um, those are all creative arts. Public communication is a creative art. And that's, some music moves us, others doesn't. Some movies move us, move us and others don't. And so the creative art has a, an element of artisticness that we've got to realize to it. It needs to be viewed in that same way as musicians and artists because being a communicator is, is like, kind of like being a singer. I can, I can't. Someone can give you singing lessons. But you've got to have a certain amount of it before you get the lessons. You could take a God-given singer, give them lessons, and double their ability. But you can't take someone who doesn't have any of that, because I guess God doesn't like them, and, and then make them a great singer. That's just not how it works. The same way is with this creative art of public communication. You've got to kind of have a certain amount of it, and then I can teach you a lot of the things we're talking about in this class, and we can go forward. But if we don't... Um, if we don't have it kind of to begin with, we got to know if we have it to begin with so that we can learn these, these other parts of it. Be biblical first. Back to that creative arts idea. Be biblical first, and then add the creative art environment to it. Okay, so in other words, don't create, and I made this mistake years ago. I had a sermon idea, and I forget it was something about time and not wasting time or something like that. I didn't even have a scripture for it. I just had this like 20 years ago but i just had this idea that i thought was from god and then i literally had to find bible verses that somehow ratified my idea that is the exact opposite way it should be done we got to have the bible and then we may add some creative elements to make sure that it's hitting all the different people in my baby pool and my shallow end and you know but first you got to start out with the content you got to start out with something to say not from your own head you know that if, if this culture this social media culture we live in everybody's sharing their own opinions from their own head we don't need any more of that we need the word of god planted into people's hearts in ways that stick in ways that make a difference because they can grab a hold of it the danger is that you can easily be deceived if you if you can take some idea and then add the bible to it there's no difference between that and what Dave Koresh did in that Branch Davidians down there in Waco, Texas, or Jim Jones in the Jonestown Mass. You know, all they did was have an idea, twist it around with some Bible, and, and you know, we got to make sure we start with the Bible first, and then we add these other elements instead of the other way around, because um, it's God's Word that transforms people <laughs> and not our own. So I believe in using a passage of Scripture. And then you put that in a way that people can remember. And if you see how we do it at our church, it's almost every message is, is in that right there. A passage of scripture, and then we break it down and put it in a way that people can remember. So when you're looking for things to preach on, just preach the Bible. Just, just read the Bible and preach the Bible. Don't, in other words, don't even look for things to preach on. 
read the Bible and write down what comes to you as you're reading the Bible. That's really the best way to approach this. Personal stories are powerful. Every sermon should have a personal story. It should be honest. The best ones are when you tell on yourself. They love that. Uh, I've stuck a couple of hundred of those in my messages over the years. Start with the, you know, start with the situation, why you feel the way you do, and then um, let it build up. The power of the personal stories, that background, lean into the background of it. When did it happen? Who were you with? And then after that, you get to the actual situation. And then at the end, you explain how that ties into what you're trying to say. I love those self-deprecating stories. Those are always the best. Um, on average, each sermon should have about one hour of preparation for every five minutes that you preach. So um, that would be for a 30-minute message, that's 25 hours of preparation. Uh, our sermons at Heartland actually have closer to about 35 hours um, of preparation that go into each message. Um, so if you think, if it, now if, you, if it's done right, it should look like it's just kind of, <laughs> coming off the top of your head and stuff but there is a lot that goes into that um there's a sermon there's research there's bible research there's you know and uh there's editing there's slides there's videos and so that's why so much time goes into it um if you're making your notes um make sure that you're proud of your notes so in other words if you're not if you're afraid of showing someone else your notes you probably are not there yet you know, if you're like, don't look at this, it's not done yet, you're not there yet. If, if you're like, look, check this out, man, I got this all, you know, here it is, do, 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 then that's probably when you know that the sermon is where it needs to be. Um, if every good message should be in a couple different forms. You should be able to preach the 90 second version of it. You should be able to preach the five minute version of it and the 30 minute version of it. So in other words, I should be able to tell you, here's really what I'm trying to say. Here is trying to say with a few things added on. And here is the whole thing busted down and, and, and chopped in, into pieces. So um, I personally like 30-minute sermons. That's what we do at Heartland. The reason is, if you notice, that's what Hollywood pumps out because I believe that's about all our little minds can take in. Um, you know, the reason why each episode of whatever is about that long is because Hollywood's already done the research about our, uh, how long our concentration can actually be and i believe it's right in that zone right there of 30 minutes resist the urge to preach all your notes you can have things scratched out there just because you wrote it on paper and even if it's good you can whack it chop it probably needs to be chopped but if you do it right it looks pretty natural it looks like you're just kind of going along and we're just kind of friends if we do it right all right well that's the end of session number one we'll be back for session number two